So, as you <clears throat> already heard from the introduction, I'm a bit of an outlier today. Um, we're mostly looking at, at sequencing data, not imaging data. There are some commonalities, as I hope to be able to convince you. And I'll try to keep time, because I'm the only thing separating you and your coffee break. So, in the first part, in the introduction, I'd like to, to tell you a bit about what, where the data comes from that we are mostly working with. Um, I'm mostly focusing on the Illumina system here because that's by far the most widely used next generation sequencer and it's also the one that, that we use here in-house. Um, the data is generated on small glass slides that could as well be microscopic slides. On these glass slides we are growing small colonies of DNA molecules. So you see them here in this, um, in this scheme. So each of these clusters or, or colonies has about a thousand DNA molecules in it and they're, they're grown there starting from a single molecule in a process that's called bridged amplification and in the end they're imaged in sequential cycles where the actual sequencing happens. The cycles basically consist of incorporation of one single base pair that is fluorescent labeled and then you take an image, so the sequencer is essentially a fluorescent microscope and you, as you cycle through this process you're incorporating an additional base, an additional base, each time taking an image and in the end you can read off the DNA sequence by just following the colors, the colors of, of a given uh, colony along those images of sequential cycles. So Sequencing data, at least on the Illumina platform to begin with, is imaging data too. That's how, how these images look like. Here you see one of them that comes out from a bit an older sequencer and you can see that the, the colonies have different sizes, they have different intensities. In the initial years it was actually also a bit of an image analysis challenge to, to to extract information from these images. These days that is pretty much solved. And that has actually also relieved us from a lot of the data management issues. So the numbers I'm giving you on this slide are a bit outdated. They are from a sequencer that was being introduced to the market in 2010. It's hard to get these numbers for the, the newest generation of the sequencers, but roughly they're tenfold higher, I would say, compared to then. So at that time, if you would run one sequencing experiment, um, that would be an experiment that roughly runs in the order of a week or so. That was producing, I'm very sorry about that, don't know why this is switching off. No, not here. So that was producing about 32 terabytes of imaging data in the course of that week in the form of many, many small TIFF files. That was very suboptimal. So at the time, actually transferring these files to a storage device was, was causing a lot of, of issues. Um, luckily, we, we, since the information content of these images is, is rather simple and well understood, you could easily reduce that, that amount of information. First step by extracting, basically the, the identifying the colony coordinates and extracting the, the intensity information. So that was like a, an order of magnitude or so in, in data reduction. And then these intensities would then be used to do the so-called base calling, basically picking the one color that is strongest at each cycle, transforming the whole thing into the actual DNA sequence. That again was roughly one order of magnitude data reduction. And uh, finally, that's, that's the raw data that I get and if we do our analysis, it's typically, again, a, a strong reduction of the data. For example, we are aligning those reads to a reference genome and then just counting, for example, the number of reads we get for a given gene to calculate one value, of which is the expression level of a gene. So, so thanks to this data reduction, we're actually not struggling with, with data issues so much anymore. While the first sequencers actually would give all these images directly to the user, these days they never leave the machine anymore. The image analysis is run while sequencing on the instrument controlling computer. 
you cannot get access to these images anymore. Also the intensity data, it comes out, but only for a short amount of time until you've had a chance to run the, the base calling. And so when people talk about sequencing raw data, they always talk about this layer. Why is it still a bit of a data issue for us? Well, the, the most important reason is because it's so cheap to sequence, people do it a lot. And I think this is nicely illustrated on this plot here, even though that's also a bit outdated. Um, if, you, if you look on the left y-axis at the moment, this shows you the number of megabytes disk storage you can buy per dollar as a function of time. And it's the blue curve here. So, this is a log scale, so the fact that this is actually a linear curve shows you Moore's law in action. It's an exponential growth, and, and that's quite nice. You get more and more disk space for, for your dollar. This is very annoying. I'm very sorry about that. Don't know how to switch this off. Um, sequencing is similar. It was also increasing exponentially over time. If you look at the yellow curve, for example, which shows the number of base pairs you can sequence per dollar using the classical Sanger dideoxy method, that was also exponential growth, although it was a lower growth rate than, than the storage space, so we didn't have any issues at all. But around the year of 2006, 2007, uh, next generation sequencing entered the markets, and you see that's our new growth rate that we have now. So this is growing faster than, than disk space. And we've already reached two years ago or so the point where it's actually cheaper to redo your experiments in two years than storing, doing the experiment today and storing the data for two years. So <clears throat> because it's so cheap, you know, storing the data becomes a relevant fraction of, the, of your cost in sequencing. And just to, to give you one example of these large data sets that are out there, People are sequencing more and more samples down to even individual cells. And um, there is one data set that has been produced by a company called 10x Genomics on a relatively simple device that is also not so expensive. And the data set consists of the transcriptome profiles for 1.3 million brain cells. So it's a, it's a microfluidics device that does all the reactions in very, very small water droplets in an oil emulsion. And the data set, as I said, has about 1.3 billion columns and about 30,000 rows. So we, we're looking at really large matrices here. And again, we have some computational challenges. One challenge is just to keep data sets like that in memory. You need a high memory machine for that, or you need some data structures that basically live on the disk. And you only access part of your data that you want to compute on. Another problem is algorithms or, or how to analyze that data. Even very simple clustering, which would require comparing all pairs of cells, would scale you know, with the order of n squared, so with the square of the number of cells you're looking at. And of, obviously, that's not feasible anymore if you're working with such data. So that's where I'd like to transition now to, to my own work or the work in my group. Um, which is a graph-based identification of cell types. That, that's a work that actually looks at data sets like this one. And this is work that is spearheaded by, by Pan in, in my group. So why would we at all want to study at transcriptomes from single cells? There is a number of reasons. One could be because you're interested in a system where you only get a few cells, like if you're studying mammalian development, you only get small embryos or, or sperm cells or oocytes. So the only way to look at them is if you're able to process single or few cells. Another reason might be if the processes that you're studying are cell autonomous and not necessarily synchronizable across cells. One example here could be transcriptional bursting. So it's known that Transcription of a gene is not a continuous process, but it's actually a more or less stochastic process that 
um, consists of phases where the gene is actively transcribed, making a couple of molecules of mRNA for that gene, and then the gene switches into a silent state and there is no mRNA mate anymore. Obviously, if you look at many cells at the same time, you're averaging out such processes and there is no way to study them. Or finally, this is the most a uh, frequent reason why you would want to look at individual cells, it's because there is some heterogeneity in your samples. It might be different cell types, it might be cells that are expressing something at different levels. And you, you want to discriminate situations of homogeneity from such heterogeneous uh, situations. So, how, how do you define a cell type? It's actually a very easy concept that almost any biologist would think, I know what a cell type is, even though if you try to really define it, it's, it's pretty hard. Our operational definition is that cell types are attractors in, in cell state space. And what, I, what do I mean by that? You can maybe imagine a high dimensional space with, let's say, thousands of axes, where the axes maybe correspond to the expression levels of different genes or proteins. And basically each cell at a given moment in time occupies one point in that space. And a cell type would basically be an attractor, so a position to which these cells are drawn towards. If you would perturb them away from the attractor, they would probably go back close to that. And there is some variation nevertheless between individual cells. So you would, you would find dense clouds of cells around these attractors and maybe there would be less cells in between these attractors. One way to represent that in, in computers would be as a graph, where basically cells would be nodes in the graph, and we would put edges between pairs of cells that we think are similar. And then these attractors could be identified by finding cliques or densely connected communities in that graph. That, that has an advantage that there is a, an immense amount of work already available that has been done on different types of networks and graphs that we can leverage for this cell type definition problem. So how do we get to that graph from the data? The data, as I mentioned, comes as a large matrix where the rows are the genes, the columns are the cells. The data is actually super sparse and super noisy. It's, it's believed that maybe only in the order of 10% of the molecules that are in a cell are actually captured by the current technology. So these matrices typically contain 90% zeros. And we don't know if these are technical dropouts. So the molecule would have been there, but we just didn't observe it. Or if there are true zeros, meaning the cell didn't express that molecule. We transform that into a cell by cell distance matrix. We use a combination of different distance matrices sorry, different metrics. Um, I don't want to go too much into the detail, but in the end we have a matrix where basically for each pair of cell we have some, some measure of their similarity, how similar their gene expression profiles are. And then we, we basically cast it as a graph at that point. You can interpret this matrix as an adjacency matrix, where basically these values give you the weight for the, the edge between a given pair of cells. And we cast it as a sparse graph. This is quite important. We want to get rid of, of most of these edges. We only want to keep the edges between cells that are really similar. I will have a slide later to, to show you how we do that. Once we have this sparse graph, we can, as I said, apply existing tools or algorithms that detect um, communities in graphs. And we can even iterate that process by using the, the centroids of these identified communities as, as reference points, which, which improves the accuracy. So how do we cast the adjacency matrix as a graph, as a sparse graph? We use a technique that is um, called G-lasso or graphical lasso, which basically tries to fit that matrix with a regularization parameter. So rather than just fitting it perfectly, we, we kind of have a a knob here that we can turn, that we can make it more stringent, which forces a lot of these entries in that matrix towards zero. So if you want to have a non-zero entry, there is a price to pay. 
And you only keep that non-zero entry if, it indeed, if these cells are indeed very similar. That's a very natural way of doing it, and it allows us even to control for artifacts or sources of, of variants that we're not interested in, like the, the batches of an experiment, for example. And maybe this is easiest to understand when I show you an application to a real data set. Um, it's a data set of roughly 800 cells coming from three patients. And for each patient, they did three different technical replicates. So we have in that data set both biological variation between the patients, but also technical variation between the replicates. And if you analyze that with standard techniques, like for example, a, a Tisney embedding, you actually find nine clusters. So not only the three patients, but also the three technical replicates. And if we analyze it through this procedure without controlling for, for the batches, you see we already do a bit better, although you still see separation of the three batches. And once we, we add this batch control to the GLASU step, you see that now the different batches mix nicely and we, we just find the three different patients. Um, I want to skip over this one for reasons of time and just go to the summary. So <clears throat> I, I showed you that there is still some data problems in genomics, even though they're, I guess, smaller than, than in the imaging community. Because we have very high dimensional data, typically consisting of many samples, and, and algorithmically, there is still a lot of work to do. We have wanted and unwanted sources of variants, um, especially in single cell RNA sequencing data. This is a huge issue. Only few tools can, can deal with that. That's actually the main reason why we developed GRIF. And if you have such data or just want to have a look at, at GRIF, it's available on, on GitHub. And uh, I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you.